Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here, and welcome to a video topic that I've wanted to cover for a very long period of time. SX70 versus 600 film. Which format of film is better? Now if you ask this question online, you are going to be inundated with a variety of different opinions with no clear answer at all. Is one sharper than the other? Does one have better color than the other? Should you have your SX70 camera, say, converted to shoot 600 film instead of SX70 film? What about iType film, right? Now, sadly, like, like a lot of advice regarding Polaroid film online, most of the answers that you'll receive if you do ask this question are based on anecdotal personal experience and not really a lot of facts. If you ask on one forum, someone will tell you that SX70 film has better contrast, where another forum member will tell you it has more pleasing pastel tones. One will say sharper, the other will say it's softer and, you know, more pleasing. So which one is it? What, what's the answer for all of this, right? One of the reasons that I started this YouTube channel was to try and clear up some of the frankly massive amount of misinformation that's present in the instant film community. Um, and basically what I want to try and do here with my channel is offer up explanations based on years of personal experience working with these cameras, or at the very least, a solid amount of theoretical framework. So I plan on answering this question today as best as I possibly can using my decades of knowledge in repairing these cameras and most importantly actually using these cameras um, my experience with shooting impossible project film, my theoretical knowledge from all of the literature that I've read over the years, and I'm sort of expecting that I'll get a few salty comments or dislikes from people that just want to kind of, um, I don't know, re reject reality and substitute in their own, because it seems like every time I do one of these videos where I try and set the record straight based on as much facts as possible, someone decides that they don't like what they're hearing and just hits the, the dislike button. So if that is you, um, just go ahead and hit the dislike button right now and then bugger off, would you? <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I, I wanted to just try and answer this in, in the best way that I possibly can. So to start with, let's play a game. I'm going to lower my camera and then I'm going to show you guys a variety of images, some of which taken by me, others taken by some, uh, some of my followers, and I want you to try and guess which one is which. Which of the films is SX-70 film, which of the films is 600? And let's see how you do at home. Alright, so if you're following along at home, I want you to have a look at the image that's in front of you and just see if you can honestly tell me what you think it is, SX-70 or 600 film, and I guarantee you there's a mixture of both here. Pretty difficult, isn't it? Now, I'm willing to guess that after a few images, you had absolutely no idea. Now, what if I told you? What if I told you that there is basically no difference between the two formats of film at all, and the vast majority of difference between shots in terms of color cast, contrast, film temperature, that kind of stuff, is instead due to a massive amount of other variables instead. Now, 
For starters, I would just like to point out that 600 film and iType film, they are exactly the same. I mean, these two films are completely identical in terms of the emulsion. The only difference is iType film does not have a battery in the pack to power the camera, whereas 600 does. iType cameras are designed to take external batteries. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, they might already know that, but I do see every now and again, people ask which is better, iType or 600. For the sake of this video, they're the same film. I'm not gonna mention it really again from this point forwards. I mainly wanna talk about SX-70 film versus 600. So, although you might know about the iType, what you may not realize is that SX-70 film and 600 film, at least in its current modern incarnation, as of Polaroid Originals producing the film, as of Impossible Project producing the film, both films are basically identical. It's just that the negative of SX-70 film is tinted by two stops, reducing the ISO from 640 down to 160. So for example, if we were to have this image and take it from the camera before it was ejected, this is SX-70 film, um, you would actually note that the negative, the, the, the brown area on the film was actually nearly black because it's tinted. So if you wanna experiment, go buy some fresh SX-70 film and buy some fresh 600 film, remove the dark slide from the pack of film and just have a look at the raw negative. One will be brown, one will be black. And that is because they're basically the same. The, the, the way that they reduce the ISO of the film is by tinting the negative two stops. Now, if you don't believe me, Simply watch this clip by Ben from In An Instant. In An Instant has a really great YouTube channel, it's very informative. Um, and he did uh, a video that went fairly viral in terms of Polaroid being concerned, uh, that, that was doing a tour of the current factory in the Netherlands. And when he released that video, they did a little spin-off video uh, in the form of a Q&A, &A, like a question and answer with two of Polaroid's uh, employees that work in the film division. And while his main factory tour video at the time of me posting this video has 169,000 views, the Q&A video that he released only has about 7,000 or so. So as a result, despite this knowledge being out for quite a while, the knowledge is pretty niche because unless you've paid attention for a one minute snippet of Ben's B-roll video from the factory tour, you may not have known this. What is your philosophy about 600 and SX-70? Like, which do you prefer personally? Um, what kind of challenges do you face producing two emulsions for color? Um, like, I don't know much about the actual back end of what yeah. distinguishes them. Quite. Basically, they are a very similar chemistry. So there is the sensitivity difference of the SX-70. It needs more light, mm -hmm. but we use the same yeah, the same chemistry, we just we incorporate a filter in the negative okay. to kind of then bring down the, the film sensitivity Interesting. to the SX-70 level. And you have to, yeah, to, uh, to make that filter neutral, but a lot of the, yeah, it's very similar. In I, I sense a dramatic result in the color, but I guess that's because of that layer or the, that adjustment. Like I, I sense like, deeper saturation. Yeah. When I'm shooting outside with 600, I'm getting a more pastel blue in the sky, whereas with the SX-70, it's a much deeper blue. Mm. Is that just a product of that? Interesting observation. <laughs> no. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. But okay. Yeah, I'm not sure wh where it would come from. I think it's, so, so the chemistry is very similar. Could be that the filter is having some effect. Mm. Mm. On but the, I mean, yeah. obviously a different camera film interaction yeah. as well. That's yeah. definitely yeah. playing a role. Yeah. Now the reason that I bring all this up is that every few videos I do about 600 modifying or i-type modifying either an SLR or a box type SX-70 camera to take 600 or i-type film, I end up attracting a few comments that allege that doing such a thing will eventually lead to the death of SX-70 film somehow. That for every camera that I modify to take 600 format film or i-type film, I personally, as a technician, am putting a nail in the coffin of SX-70 film. And what I'm here to tell you in this video is that SX-70 film is kinda already dead. What we have instead is 600 film 
that has had its ISO crippled through use of an internal ND filter, which, if I'm going to be totally honest here, does a great job of emulating the real thing, but it's not better than 600 film. See, I believe that most of the SX70 film's reputation comes from its original formulation, in particular Time Zero. See, Time Zero was sort of like Polaroid's equivalent of Kodachrome. It was a legendary film stock known not just for having great colours, but an almost instantaneous developing time. Truly, it was the definition of instant, taking only seconds for an image to appear. Now, Time Zero found itself rather favoured by artists, um, partly due to its emulsion being particularly soft for the first 24 hours or so before it set. And this allowed people, through uh, using tools to uh, manipulate the image and sort of push that soft emulsion around. Um, now, a famous example of this that, that sticks out in my mind is the album cover for Peter Gabriel's third solo album, where his face is kind of melting off on one side. What I'm trying to say here is that this film emulsion was pretty damn famous, and it sort of set the standard for what Polaroid film should look like. And when you combine Time Zero film with the excellent series of folding SLR SX70 cameras, uh, you end up with a reputation that this particular film and camera combination, especially if you're an artist, is pretty much the best you can get. So we know that the original Time Zero formulation was considered a classic, and it no longer exists. And modern SX70 film and 600 film are in essence, the exact same film, but with a slightly tinted negative. So why then does there appear to be so much discussion over which film looks better, when realistically they're pretty much the same? Why do so many people harp on about the tones of SX-70 film as if they were some kind of audiophile discussing the merits of the deeper bass on a 180 gram vinyl remaster, or a sommelier describing which stone fruits you should be tasting in a Chardonnay? Now, this might be somewhat of a controversial opinion, but honestly, I think that a lot of the discussion between the differences in SX-70 and 600 film is kind of placebo. Now, the truth of the matter is there is going to be differences between film stocks, it's just that the reason for that might not be the one that you expect. The fact is that when it comes to colour, contrast, uh, sharpness in an image, there is a massive amount of variables beyond just simply, well, one is SX-70 film and one is 600 film. So what I'm going to try and do now is explain basically the best I can based off my direct experience and my repair knowledge in terms of why there is seemingly so much difference between different batches and, and, and film stocks when it comes to Polaroid. Now, before I dive into the many different amounts of variables that can come into play when talking about colour, contrast and sharpness in terms of SX-70 versus 600 film, I wanted to just quickly discuss one of the most commonly cited videos that gets referenced when doing these kind of comparisons, and that is the video titled Polaroid SX-70 vs. 600 uh, Film, a side-by-side -side comparison by the channel Learn Film Photography. Uh, as of the time of me doing this video, it has about 9,000 views. Uh, Brooklyn Film Camera also did a video on about, about this subject too, uh, also happening to feature Ben. Hi, Ben. Um, and both of them ultimately come to the conclusion that SX-70 is somehow more contrasty and punchy. Um, in particular, the Learn Film Photography podcast seems to really allude that the SX-70 uh, is able to produce deeper blacks. But what I would like to point out, uh, particularly in the Learn Film Photography video, is they were comparing two different types of film using two different cameras. So one uh, Mint Time Machine camera, the SL6, uh, SLR670, uh, and then just a random SX70 sonar. It doesn't say whether or not that camera was refurbished. And the images they get mm, were clearly taken from different batches of film, and it may not reflect what's happening in future batches. That video at the time of me making this video is two years old, and as we're going to see, the chemical formulation does change over time and even month to month. In terms of blacks, I know these are different images taken on 
different batches of film. Um, but let's just have a look at the blacks, right? Uh, maybe you want to guess at home which one is the SX-70 and which ones are the 600. Remember that SX-70 is allegedly supposed to have deeper blacks and a higher amount of contrast. Well, we have 600, 600, 600. These two are both SX-70 film. Um, when we have a look at the black, the blacks are actually deeper in the 600 film that I have there. Now, is that going to be the case all the time? Well, probably not, because depending on month to month, the different batch of film that you get, this may change. It may swap and become the other way around or vice versa. There's a lot more variables going on here than just one film versus the other. And making direct comparisons as such, I, I know the Learn Film Photography podcast tried to be as scientific as possible, but there's just way too many variables. Even if you try and control the situation where you're taking the photo, there's way too much other stuff going on for you to make a concrete comparison. Now, one of the first things that you should know is that Polaroid is constantly tweaking the formula of their film. Month to month, batches of film vary slightly. If you look, for example, on the side of a pack of film, stamped into the side of the cardboard, it'll be kind of hard to see here because it's like an embossed impression in the cardboard, but there is a date code. Uh, this particular pack, which is still unopened, dates back to March 2023, so it's well and truly a year old by this point. Um, but the date codes on the film indicate when the film was produced, and roughly once a month the batch of film changes slightly. If you've ever wanted to go back and look at what batch of film your, uh, you were shooting at the time, it's actually stamped in the code at the back of the film too. Um, basically it is the the last two digits of the film will tell you whether or not it's 600 or SX-70. Basically, if the number is 80-something, so this one's 86, if the number is 80-something, it is 600 film. If that last two digits is 70-something, it's SX-70 film. And if you go to the four digits, just to the left of that, that tells you the, the date code. So this is 0323. And despite being a year old, it's a really nice stock of film. I, I got really great colors from this batch, despite the fact that it's been stored at room temperature for an entire year. Now, the reason that Polaroid changes their formula so much is a bit of a long story and one that's ideally explained in another video, but ultimately it comes down to the fact that when Polaroid first shut down their factory in 2009, the chemical supply for Polaroid's film also shut down. So when Impossible Project took the Herculean task of starting up the factory again, they had to basically do so without all the chemicals necessary to make the film, and pretty much had to start again from scratch. Now, my understanding is that some of the chemicals required to produce the film had long been since sort of outlawed for environmental reasons, and were kind of only allowed to be produced for Polaroid because of like a grandfather clause where because Polaroid had been using those chemicals for such a long time they were allowed to keep using them. That's my understanding at least. Um, but yeah, some of the chemicals were very hard to produce, very specialized, were produced by companies only for Polaroid. Some of the other chemicals had been outlawed. So Pol uh, Impossible Project, who would later become Polaroid Originals, really had to start again from scratch. Now. To put this into perspective, imagine that you purchase a factory that makes bread, right? Like Wonder Bread. And you purchase this factory and only to be told that, well, you can't use wheat flour in any of your bread. <laughs> now, alternatives to wheat exist. You know, you could use rice flour, for example, but the bread's never going to be quite the same. <laughs> it's the same thing with Polaroid film. Now. Impossible Project would continue to improve formulation over the last decade or so, and honestly, like I said before, I, I think their modern batches of film look really, really good. Um, but 
The truth is that they're still trying to constantly improve, and if you watch the full question and answer video that Ben did, you'll listen to how they're still trying to improve things such as stability, developing time, and the opacification layer. Now, one of the things that makes me laugh about that particular situation is that current Polaroid film often cops a bit of a bad reputation for having so much variance within its batches of film, but the irony here is that that variance comes from Polaroid trying to improve the film in the first place. Polaroid, at the moment, doesn't have the budget that they used to when Dr. Edwin Land was in charge of the company. They can't afford to spend billions of dollars perfecting film, they kind of have to just tweak the formulation on the fly, which is why it tends to change from month to month. So <laughs> what always makes me kind of laugh is that the people that tend to complain about the variants uh, are the same people that won't let Polaroid tweak the formula. It's just how it is, and it's how it's been since the Impossible Project. So forget trying to compare 600 film with SX-70 film, you try and compare 600 film to other batches of 600 film. Because it can vary quite a bit. I remember uh, about a year or so ago, the 0722 and the 0922 batches were just absolutely amazing. Like they were really, really clear quality, like this one here. And then you had batches like 0123, which was widely considered quite a dud batch. And that one had just the contrast cranked all the way to 11. There was crystals forming all over the film. Um, it just really wasn't a particularly good batch. Um, but like I said, you were comparing batches produced only a few months apart, let alone comparing different types of film, adding more variables into account. This is just comparing two different lots of 600 film. And the other thing to consider here with batches is they do have an expiry date. As the time goes on, the chemicals that sit in the three little developing pods, you know, if you've ever picked up a Polaroid photo and you've wondered what these three little patches are at the back of the image, this is where the developing chemicals are stored that get spread over the film. And what happens is as those developing chemicals get affected by temperature or they start to dry out or they just simply age, image quality and the color and that kind of stuff tends to age as well. And so you may end up getting, you know, more motley bits and pieces happening through your film compared to if it was fresh, for example. Um, and this is just a byproduct of this film being an analog product. It's not digital. It's not something that is perfectly replicatable every single time. And I'd also like to point out, this is not exclusive to modern Polaroid film either. Once the film is expired or heat damaged, even original Polaroid film from back in the day would end up with colour shifts uh, and undeveloped patches. Now, admittedly, they were generally less dramatic, and the film often took much longer to expire in the first place, but the fact of the matter is, a huge amount of variance exists in between batches of the same film let alone comparing two different kinds. So the film might be a little bit unpredictable depending on the batch, but what about what Ben said in that earlier clip regarding the blue skies? Well, I think I have an explanation for this. Now, as of the time of me releasing this video, if you get a pack of Polaroid SX-70 film, or you go on Polaroid's website, you'll notice that Polaroid will recommend to use SX-70 film particularly in a folding SLR camera, they recommend setting the light dark wheel a notch or so towards the darker side. So on an SX-70 it would look like that, on a box camera they say to crank the wheel over at least one line, but the guide also says that that's a good starting point, you may need to crank it further. Now. Polaroid claim the reason for this is because modern film is faster than the original SX-70 film, and although that's technically true, it's not really relevant in this particular case. Now, truthfully, this is another topic that I'd love to explore in way more detail at a later date, but I'm going to keep it very brief here. Effectively, classic original SX-70 film was 150 ISO. 
Now, modern SX-70 film is 160 ISO. So yes, technically that's a different of 10 ISO, but that's a very negligible amount. That's a difference of only 6.7%, which if we use a bit of Photoshop to change what a 6% brightness increase would look like on a Polaroid, would be the difference between this and this. Truthfully, it's such a small variance that you really can't accurately measure it even on a light meter. Like, try for yourself. Get yourself a little handheld light meter and try and dial in the difference between like 150 or 160 ISO. It's such a small difference that it's imperceptible in terms of the values of the aperture and shutter speed that you need. It's realistically not going to make a difference to your exposure to have such a small difference in ISO. It's, it's only a 10 ISO difference. As I said, it's only about 6.7%. So the real reason that Polaroid recommends you change the light dark wheel setting actually has less to do with the film speed and more to do with, well, that's just what the staff at Polaroid seemed to think. Um, the real reason that you need to do this is typically if you're going to be shooting on an unrefurbished SX-70 camera, because the way that SX-70 cameras tend to fail as they age, and if you've watched my videos on this subject before, you'll know what I'm talking about, is that many SX-70s, as they age, tend to get corrosion on the electric eye. So if I pull out some old spare PCBs, we can see white crustiness on the electric eye. Here's another one. Uh, here's one that's in great condition. It's very variable, right? Um, depending on how the camera was stored, depending on how it aged, depending on how, how it was used, all, so many different things. The amount of corrosion on the electric eye can vary, but the net result is that, as a general rule of thumb, you'll find that most old SX-70 cameras will tend to overexpose photos. And as I said, the degree of electric eye corrosion varies from camera to camera, and thus the degree of overexposure will vary from camera to camera. Now, what ended up happening is that the customer service team working for Impossible Project slash Polaroid, uh, very likely being web developers and not chemical or mechanical engineers, they saw this ISO difference written down. They noted fairly consistent overexposure issues in their clients' cameras, and they just assumed it must be to do with that film. Now, how do I know this? Because the author of the article that is on the Polaroid website that tells you to set the light dark wheel to the darker side, replied to a Reddit post that I did on this very subject. And basically what it came down to is the team's direct experience, they found a system that kind of works, and they just ran with it. But the truth is, it's although it works, the reason f behind it is not correct. <laughs> So instead of Polaroid saying, hey, by the way, your camera's 50 years old and, you know, it may need a service because it's probably going to overexpose photos, they decided to say, set the light dark wheel to the darker side when shooting SX-70 film. See, a properly serviced SX-70 camera should expose perfectly with the light dark wheel set to the middle. That is why if you open and close an SX-70 camera, it will reset the wheel pretty much back to the middle. Um, that's how it's designed to work. Now, calibrating an old SX-70 that's sat around in grandpa's attic for the last 40 or 50 years can sometimes feel like more of an art than a science. As I said before, some SX-70s corrode a lot and need a lot of recalibration and a lot of compensation, while others need hardly any at all because somehow the electric eye has stayed minty fresh the entire time. It all depends on the specifics of the camera and how, how the universe treated it over those years. But most SX-70 shooters will do as they're told. Some clients may buy 
a refurbished camera. Some clients might already own, say, a Fairchild camera, where the electric eye is far less prone to corrosion. Um, some people must just might just be really, really lucky and get like an SX-70 sonar or something that's been stored in a time capsule and is perfectly, you know, in excellent condition in terms of the eye. And those same people will end up following that generic advice, set the light dark wheel to the side, despite their camera, you know, functioning perfectly well set to the middle. And so what those people end up doing is unintentionally taking ever so slightly underexposed photos all the time. And so one of the things that gets debated a lot is what color the sky should technically be on an SX-70 film. Now there's so many variables that come into play, such as the position of the sun, the time of year, um, clouds in the sky, or probably UV, like there's so many things that come into play here. But as a general rule of thumb, if you're taking a photo of the sky, the darker you set the light dark wheel, the deeper blue your image is going to be. For example. So in that clip, when Ben talks about 600 film generally developing very pastel tones, well, here's an example of um, pretty decently exposed 600 film. It was a very hot day. We can see it's captured all the shadows in the tree. The bricks on the roof are a pretty decent condition. If we take that same photo and set the wheel to a little bit under, we tend to get a darker sky. And we can repeat that as often as we'd like, just ever setting the wheel darker and darker and darker. The truth is that the sky on Polaroid film should kind of look like a pale blue. If you're getting it looking this blue, it's because your photo is underexposed. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, this particular image here, the building here is, is quite crisp and quite white. And we can see here that because of the slight underexposure, the image uh, has turned the building slightly darker and the sky as a result has turned this brilliant sapphire blue. Now, I would agree that this is a very pretty looking photo, but it's not necessarily true to life. But this photo is something that you could easily get on an SX-70 if it was functioning pretty decently and you followed Polaroid's directions of cranking the light dark wheel to the darker side. Now, I'm not saying that this example is present on every single uh, person that's compared the color of the, the blue sky from SX-70 shooting uh, an SX-70 film versus 600, but I'm saying that it probably goes a long way to explaining a little bit about what's going on. There really is no uniform blue of a sky. There's just what looks kind of right. And this color of sky, I find the most consistent in cameras that I personally calibrate. Now, while we're on the subject of color, perhaps it's a good time to mention that temperature extremes can and will affect the color cast in Polaroid film. Now, typically, and your mileage may vary here, um, heat, so that's very hot temperature above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit for those that follow me in the US, will tend to cause the film to shift to a very purpley magenta type look. Whereas photos taken in quite cold weather, so typically below sort of 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, well, that will tend to go the opposite direction. It'll shift towards cyan and the image will look much cooler. Now, I don't necessarily believe that this is a big contributing factor to the SX-70 versus 600 film debate, but it does bear mentioning here, especially when it comes to long-term heat damage. See, if film is stored in a very hot warehouse, my experience is that it can shift to magenta over time, even if you then shoot that film in a condition that's not particularly hot. So I know here, for example, in Australia, 600 and I-type films are very common to find in brick and mortar stores. It's where I get most of my film from, just my local office supply store. And that's because it's 
very popular film and it's readily available, right? But generally when you buy it at a brick and mortar store like that, they're not necessarily refrigerating it or storing it properly. And in my experience, there's a higher chance of your 600 film sitting around for longer than if you purchase SX-70 film. And the reason for that is SX-70 film, again, at least here in Australia, tends to be much more of a niche product. It's typically sold only through photography supply stores, which will have a, like, a higher likelihood of storing their film properly. This might be one of the reasons as to why SX-70 film can generally appear to be more reliable in terms of its colors, because you're simply purchasing it generally from a store that hopefully should know what they're doing in regards to storing it. Um, being sort of far less common to purchase, it's more likely to be stored correctly as opposed to, you know, the bulk five pack of iType that you purchased that sat at the bottom of a hot stationary cupboard next to the Fuji and Stax Minis for the last two years. Now, another suggestion from the video is that somehow the nature of the ND material, whether it's baked into the negative or put on the outside of the, the pack of film, could somehow, you know, perhaps positively be affecting how those images came out. Um, I'm not entirely convinced on that. ND filter material um, tends not to produce much of a color cast if you use it on like a, a 600 film camera. And you can experiment for yourself. If you have a 600 capable camera, you can take a standard 600 photo, then get yourself some of this ND filter, put it over both the lens and the electric eye, and all that's gonna do is trick both of them into slowing down the camera shutter speed. You're still gonna get a correct exposure, but you'll be able to compare the color cast directly. And I've never noticed a dramatic difference when using ND filter material. Um, if it really did make a difference and the ND material was the sole thing causing this alleged uh, improvement in colors for SX-70 film, well, I would argue that it would be theoretically very easy to replicate the results just using some ND filter material over the lens and over the electric eye. So a little digression, but again, something that you can experiment with. Now, the other thing I wanted to just explain as well, based on my previous point, is why the reason that SX-70 film is way more niche than 600 film, and why I choose to iType a lot of my clients' cameras uh, and 600 convert them at the very least, and that's simply just a numbers game. 600 type cameras outsold the folding SX-70 by a factor of a, around 20 to one, and According to one of the heads of Polaroid Australia, who I spoke to at the launch of the Polaroid i2, for every single pack of 600 film that gets sold, so for every one pack of eight photos of 600 that gets sold, they sell one bulk pack of iType. So iType film outsells 600 here in Australia by a factor of five to one. And I'm gonna guess that 600 film outsells SX-70 film by a factor of five to one. And it's just simply a numbers game. Modern Polaroid cameras use iType film, 600 cameras use 600 film, and if your SX-70 film isn't modified, it's gonna need SX-70 film, and there are just simply way more 600 cameras around than these things. It's just simply a numbers game. The truth is, only nerds use the SX-70. Most casual shooters are off with a 600 or an iType camera. It's as simple as that. So I've talked quite a bit about color, but what about sharpness? Well, one of the things I see frequently cited in posts over, um, over my time perusing the internet on Polaroid-based material is that 600 film is often described as being sharper than SX-70 film. Although I will say that I've actually had this scene described as the other way around, and well, clearly you can't have it both ways. Which one is it? Is 600 sharper or is SX-70 sharper? Now, some of this might depend on the camera that you use. Clearly, if you use an SLR uh, camera such as the 680, 690, or, an, or a 600 modified SX-70, um, you are using a four element glass lens. If you're using 
say, a simple box camera, you're only getting perhaps a single element meniscus lens made of plastic. Now, for the sake of consistency, I'm only going to be referring to the folding SLR models here and just take the camera out of the equation because every SLR model, whether it be an SX70, a Sonar, an Alpha, a 680, a 690, they all have the exact same lens and the exact same ability of performance. Um, now, I don't believe one film is inherently sharper than the other, but one factor that does greatly increase sharpness for 600 film is its increase in film speed. Now, remember that 600 type film is 640 ISO. SX70 film in its current incarnation is 160 ISO. So that basically means 600 speed film is four times faster. And as a result, the shutter, of which I have a disassembled one in my hand, will need to operate four times faster. Now, the way that the shutter system works on a folding SLR camera means that when you're shooting a higher ISO, the shutter not only uses a faster shutter speed, but also a smaller aperture for a photo given of any, for a photo taken at any given exposure. And the faster shutter speed is going to reduce motion blur, while the stop down aperture will greatly increase image sharpness and widen the depth of field, which will result in the image seeming much sharper. And that extra sharpness is one of the reasons that the SLR 680, which I have one here, this is obviously designed for using 600 film natively. You often see people describe that one of the reasons the 680 is such a great camera is because of how sharp its images can be. And that doesn't really have anything to do with the optical design of the 680. It's just the fact that it natively takes 600 film. See, when the SX-70 shutter fires, if the shutter is very slow, the lens stays mainly open towards F8, like so. See how the whole thing gets a chance to open up and close? So that might be like, I don't know, a quarter of a second, something like that. I'm going to do this a little bit in slow motion. If we give it a faster shutter speed, like that, we can see the aperture stops down much smaller. And if we had a really fast aperture, uh, a really fast shutter speed, I should say, it would produce only a little pinhole. So depending on how fast you fire the SX-70 or the 680 shutter, the size of the aperture is going to change quite dramatically. And as I said, this is one thing that will drastically alter the perceived sharpness of your camera. It's worth noting that the SX-70 lens, the 116mm f8 Tessar design, is actually pretty soft when you shoot wide open at f8. It tends to suffer from quite a bit of flare, some chromatic aberration, and less contrast the wider it shoots. If you use the film speed with the higher ISO and your shutter is calibrated for such, the fact that the aperture tends to stop down a lot more for the same given scene will make the image appear to have more sharpness or less glow, less pastel looks. It has nothing really to do with the film itself and more to do with the fact that the camera interaction Camera film interaction with said film is using smaller apertures and faster shutter speeds. And that's, like I said, one of the main reasons 600 film often has a reputation for being sharper. Um, as I said before, the truth is that all folding SLR models have the exact same 116mm f8 Tessar lens formula, regardless of the specific model of the camera. Um, the reason that the film is sharper is just because the aperture tends to stop down quite a bit more. Um, if you want to see an example of this, as I alluded to before, get yourself some ND material and put it over both the lens and the electric eye of, say, I don't know, an SLR 680, right? You can use any kind of ND material. What that will do it will reduce the light going through both lenses and as a result trick the camera into thinking it's darker and it's going to shoot by default at a wider aperture. So this is a little bit of a hack, like if you want to get more, I guess, bokeh or more blurriness in your photos, 
you could simply put some ND filter material over the lens and the eye, and that's effectively going to reduce 600 film in a 600 modified camera down to basically shooting SX70 film. And the cool thing about that is ND filter material is very cheap to purchase. So give that a shot for yourself. If you want to try and seek out more of a dreamy pastel look, try simply filtering the front of the camera. And this really brings me to the main point of my video, in that is there really a reason for modern SX70 film to exist? If it disappeared, would we really miss it all that much? In my opinion, not really. The advantages to shooting 600 film, especially in a modified SX70, more than outweigh any cons. The film is far more common to find because 600 cameras at the very least were just far more popular. It's generally cheaper to buy, has an ISO that's four times faster, resulting in sharper images and better performance in low light scenarios. And the truth is that with 160 ISO film and a lens that is only the maximum of f8, you are really limited to all but the brightest of sunny days. Any arguments of colors being better in SX70 format over 600 are debatable at best. The truth is that we are very lucky that Polaroid made these types of film, whether it's 600, SX70, iType, all based around the basic design. Sort of like how 35mm you can get lots of different uh, ISOs and varieties, it's kind of the same with Polaroid. What that means is we end up with a film where it's very easy to modify one into the other. The packs are physically the same size. In the case of 600 and iType, it's the same ISO. In the case of SX70, which is that lower ISO, you can still modify the camera to shoot the faster film. It's not like, you know, we're shooting Polaroid Spectra film here, which has a different pack, a different size, a different type of camera, and is not easy to adapt. It's very easy to swap around the different types of films. So when I see people get upset that SX70 film might somehow miraculously disappear if we keep using iType film, I just don't buy it. It's really not that difficult for Polaroid to change the formulation of the film. They very likely already do it in small batches anyway for SX70 film. The only big difference is the negative that goes into the film emulsion itself that sits behind this black part here. The pack, the battery, everything else is basically the same. So it's not like Spectra film where they destroyed all of that machinery in order to make uh, new machinery to make the smaller format of, of Polaroid go. The machinery is still there. They don't need any bespoke new stuff. It's the same technology that goes into producing SX-70 film that it does with 600. I just, I don't see it ever truly disappearing anytime soon, but also on the other breath, I'd argue it kinda already is gone. I mean, modern SX-70 film is just tinted 600 film, so is it even really still here? Or are people just concerned that they wanna be able to buy a specific pack of film and use it in their camera without any modifications whatsoever. I, I'm not really sure. But for me, 600 film is the winner by far, purely because of its higher ISO. The ability for me to take photos like this, which was taken at the equivalent of one quarter of a second, handheld, it's super crispy sharp. Right, this was using my SX-70R, so this camera right here, using the dongle, I measured the light meter myself. This was one quarter of a second effective speed. If I had been using SX-70 film, that speed would have been one entire second instead of one quarter of a second. And one quarter of a second, I can just hold still enough, hand holding, to have the image come out perfectly. But one second, 
that's absolutely pushing even my limits, and I consider myself someone that has pretty steady hands when it comes to taking photos. The versatility outweighs any theoretical advantage of color, in my opinion, because I'd rather take a sharp photo in any situation that I might come across than have one with potentially, arguably, maybe better colors, which as I think I've discussed enough already, is a debatable topic at best. I've been shooting film for a long period of time. I've been shooting SX-70 film and 600 film ever since the early days of Impossible Project starting in around 2011. And I just haven't seen any compelling evidence <laughs> um, to prove that one format is better than the other. As far as I'm concerned, they're pretty darn similar. And that's all I really wanted to talk about today. I don't think there's any one right or wrong answer here, but what I wanted to do, my aim of this video was to just encourage discussion about the topic because there's so many people that talk about it like it's some kind of steadfast rule and I just think there's more variables to take into consideration than anyone ever mentions. So on that note, I think I'm going to leave it. I don't think there's really too much for me to add. I would love for you to guys to jump in on the comments below. Let me know if you think I missed something. Let me know if you have something to add to the conversation. Uh, let me know if you liked this kind of video comparing two different things. I know you guys generally like the comparison videos quite a bit. Um, so I'd be very keen to see uh, what your thoughts and opinions are. Um, try and keep the comments, as always, pretty civilized down below. Uh, if you learned something new from today's video, well, feel free to let me know about that. Obviously, if you want your camera converted to iType or 600, or you just simply want me to refurbish it and keep it original to take SX-70 film because you're a bit of a purist, I'm happy to do so too. If you want to support me, links are down below to my coffee account, or what I would prefer you do, simply send a camera my way for me to refurbish for you. Uh, it's my full-time job, it's how I make a living, and any little bit and piece is a great way of saying thanks. Remember to like and subscribe. I will see you in the next video.